ஐபோவன் வணக்கம் அஸ்லாமு அலைக்கும் கிரீட்டிங்ஸ் டு ஆல் ஐ ஆம் லயனல் போப்புகே அ கோ கன்வீனர் ஆஃப் த வாய்ஸ் ஃபார் டெமோக்ரஸி இன் ஸ்ரீலங்கா இன்டர்நேஷனல் கலெக்டிவ் ஐ வெல்கம் ஆல் ஆஃப் யூ ஹூ ஹாவ் ஜாயின் அஸ் வை ஜூம் அண்ட் சோஷியல் மீடியா பிளாட்ஃபார்ம் சச் அஸ் ஃபேஸ்புக் அண்ட் யூடியூப் திஸ் வெபினார் இஸ் பீங் கண்டக்டட் ஃப்ரம் த ட்ரெடிஷனல் லேண்ட்ஸ் ஆஃப் த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் நேஷன்ஸ் பீப்புள் இன் ஆஸ்திரேலியா the vurunjeri people of the kulan nation who are the traditional custodians of this land we pay our respects to the elders past present and emerging and the elders of other first nation communities i will be moderating this webinar and wish to thank my colleagues mr ranjit virasinghe for the technical and administrative assistance and mr anthony gration for administrative assistance i am grateful to anthony for attending to the organizing of this webinar while i wasn't feeling well i also thank mr mansoor and ms sena ratna for helping out with interpretations in tamil and sinhala a few housekeeping matters the webinar is conducted in english those who wish to follow the sinhala or tamil translation can do so only on the live webinar please follow the instruction you see now on your zoom screen give me a second at the bottom of the screen you will see the control panel with different icons the second last one on the right side is the interpretation icon click this icon and then select the language you wish to follow sinhala or tamil and then click mute original audio if you cannot work this out please post a comment in the chat box and direct it to mr ranjit veer singh who will happily help you out this webinar i will remove the sharing sorry give me a second this webinar will have four presentations by our panelists each presentation is limited to 15 minutes at the end of each presentation there will be a 10 minute q and a session relating to the matters raised by the speaker we will conclude the webinar with a 30 to 40 minute discussion of any other questions or comments you the audience may have please be brief when you posting your comments using the chat line or the q and a feature in zoom please direct your query to a specific panelist and i kindly request the panelists to provide short and succinct responses of no more than 3 minutes now let me make some remarks prior to introducing the distinguished panelists voices for democracy are reverberating in many countries where people's rights and freedoms are being usurped by fundamentalist and autocratic regimes around the world they are openly and covertly resorting to desperate attempts at repressing and destroying democratic movements in some countries people have succeeded in thwarting them in others the autocrats have prospered in a few instances people themselves have brought autocrats to power the latest examples are in iran the united states and sri lanka repressing dissent is not new in the history of sri lanka this repressive dragnet has not only entrapped innocent peaceful protesters on the flimsiest of judicial excuses but also those who have nothing to do with the protest movement currently the protest leaders like the convener of the inter university students federation comrade vasanta mudalige the convener of the inter university bikkhus federation venerable sridhar matero are still being held under the all encompassing undemocratic prevention of terrorism act they have so far been held for close to 3 months they were demanding the government of sri lanka to address the issues that gave rise to the current economic and political crisis 
Several protest leaders are jailed under inhumane conditions. We cannot have any realistic hope of overcoming the present crisis in Sri Lanka unless we critically look at the economic, social and governance issues, all of which are intertwined and perpetuate the crisis. Also crucial is the need for genuine reconciliation between communities. The recent protest wave, unlike earlier ones, was able to force the resignations of the prime minister, several ministers, and ultimately the president. However, after Mr. Ranil Lickramasinghe was selected and installed as president, his repressive regime had continued to launch vicious assaults on anti-government protests. Already, many in the international community, including the United Nations, have condemned such attacks. In Australia, the Victorian Trades Hall Council has expressed its solidarity with the victims of repression. How can anybody in the diaspora support such an undemocratic and violent regime? It is a question the expatriates and the international community need to ponder. Mr. Vikram Singh has wantonly and willfully used the dictatorial powers vested in the executive presidency, buttressed by the emergency powers and the Draconian Prevention of Terrorism Act to suppress dissent and arrest peaceful protesters in an attempt to root out the leadership of the protest movement. And in doing so, he is erroneously branding them terrorists. These tactics have been used many times in the past so as to direct people's attention away from their incompetence and misdeeds. The regime is now trying to employ new tools of repression, such as the Rehabilitation Bill, which can be arbitrarily used to arrest and hold any individual who has the potential to become a political adversary. Like in the past, the regime has shown little ability to resolve the unprecedented spiraling socioeconomic crisis or the capacity for protecting the most vulnerable in society. It has embarked on an extensive austerity drive, hence the need to repress the protest movement and resort to scapegoatism. This need to be understood and exposed. People are demanding transparency, accountability, and their rights. They demand opportunities to define their identities, set precedents for inclusive political processes, and create a constitution that represents their aspiration. Let us support them in this long and arduous political journey. Thank you. Let me now introduce our panelists. But there is a change in the speaking order as uh, Professor Jayadevo Yangwada will join a little bit later. So I will go to Dr. Jampati Vikramaratna. Dr. Vikramaratna is an attorney at law and president's council. He received his first doctorate for his thesis, Fundamental Rights in Sri Lanka from the University of Peradeniya and second from the University of Colombo for his published work, Democratic Governance in Sri Lanka. He was a member of the 2015 parliament and a member of the steering committee of the Constitutional Assembly. Dr. Vikramatha was a member of the drafting team of the Constitution Bill of year 2000. Let us invite Dr. Vikramaratna to share his thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. <clears throat> Can you see the screen, Lionel? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, also, uh, thank you for all the uh, participants for joining this uh, discussion. I was asked by the organizers to talk about the constitutional issues that have arisen from the two constitutional amendment bills, one of the one by the SJB, the 21st Amendment Bill, which did not become law, and the Government of Sri Lanka's 22nd Amendment Bill, which is now certified as the 21st Amendment, because there is no 21st Amendment that was passed. Uh, <clears throat> now, I first deal with uh, Article 2 of the Constitution. Article 2 of our constitution says that in the Republic of Sri Lanka, sovereignty is in the people and that it includes the powers of government, fundamental rights and franchise. Then Article 4 
gives the manner of the exercise of sovereignty. Legislative power of the people, executive power of the people, including the defense of Sri Lanka to be exercised by the president, who is to be elected by the people, judicial power, fundamental rights, and the franchise, which shall be exercised at the election of the president of the Republic of Sri Lanka and the members of parliament and at, at every referendum. Now, Article 30 has not been given the prominence that it should have been given in this, in this discourse on the executive presidency. Article 30 says that there shall be a president who shall be the head of the state, head of the executive and of the government. I have marked that in blue. And the commander in chief of the armed forces. Now, what is in blue was not there in the 1972 constitution. All the, the rest was there. Now, that is what makes the president becoming the head of the government become, makes the constitution a presidential constitution, a presidential form of government. That is important. And Article 32, 30 sub 2, says that the president shall be elected by the people and shall hold office for a term of five years. Now, there are certain provisions which we call entrenched provisions that if those are to be changed, there will have to be a referendum. Or if there is an inconsistency with any of those entrenched provisions, there would have to be a referendum in addition to a two-thirds majority. Now, clearly, uh, they, are, they are listed in Article 83 and Article 3, which I referred to earlier, sovereignty is there. But Article 4, if I go back to Article 4, Article 4, which gives the manner of the exercise of sovereignty, is not included in the entrenched provisions. And what is important the legislative history is that Article 4 was to be included in Article 83, to be entrenched in the, in the bill that was published and the, in the Gazette, that Gazette. But it was deleted during the committee stage of parliament in 1978. And in the 13th Amendment case, the majority of the Supreme Court said that this omission of Article 4 from entrenched provisions must be considered to be deliberate and that it allows Article 4 to be changed as long as sovereignty is not violated. <clears throat> now, what the Supreme Court has not considered is also that Article 30 is not entrenched. 30 sub-Article 1 is not entrenched. And in Article 30 sub-Article 2, only what, is, what I have underlined is uh, what not to underline is entrenched. The president of the Republic of Sri Lanka shall be elected by the people. That is not entrenched. The, the party in yellow is entrenched to the extent that the term of office cannot be extended beyond six years, but it can be decreased. And that is what we did in the 19th Amendment. It, read, it was reduced to five without a referendum. So you see, Article 4 and Article 30, the all important articles, are not entrenched as requiring a, a referendum. The SJB's Bill of 2022 proposed the complete abolition of the executive presidency. Article 4 was to be amended to provide that executive power shall be exercised by the president and the cabinet of ministers. The cabinet of ministers being brought in as provided in the constitution. President would be elected by the people. And sorry, I'm sorry, president would be elected by the by parliament and not directly by the people. President, president would not be the head of government anymore and that the and president would act on the advice of the prime minister, who is the head of the cabinet of ministers. Now the Supreme Court, I, I earlier mentioned that the, in the 13th Amendment case, it said Supreme Court majority said that Article 4 can be changed as long as sovereignty is not violated. Now, in 2022, the Supreme Court said that that part of the judgment on the 13th Amendment is what we call in legal parlance an obiter dictum, that it is not essential to the final de determination of the case. Because the majority in the 13th Amendment had already held that the unitary character of Sri Lanka was not violated by the 13th Amendment, by the establishment of provincial councils. And therefore, 
the view taken by the Supreme Court in, two, in, two, in, in the 13th Amendment that Article 4 can be changed without, as long as sovereignty is not violated. In 2022, the Supreme Court thought that it is a obiter dictum, not essential to the final decision, and therefore that it, the court is not bound by what the majority said in the 13th Amendment case. Now, having said that, the Supreme Court formulated a new test, a two-part test. It's a bit long, but I've reproduced it as it is. It's Supreme Court said that people are sovereign and people delegate their sovereignty to various organs of government. Sovereignty is identified in Article 3. And Article 4 deals with both the delegation and the exercise of different features of sovereignty. And in terms of Article 4b, which is the one that is crucial to us in this case, people have delegated their exercise of sovereignty to the president elected by them. And any change in that such in such delegation, which brings in another person or an institution, would have to be with the approval of the people. Otherwise, as otherwise, it would infringe Article 13, which means that if you bring the, in this case, the SJB bill, to bring in the cabinet of ministers to exercise sovereign, uh, exercise executive power would require a referendum. And then the alienation test, that the transfer, re relinquishment or removal of a power attributed to one organ of government to another would also be would also require a referendum. That is, that is, if a power is taken from one organ of government and given to another organ, then it would require a referendum. And the Supreme Court therefore held, using these two tests formulated by them, by, by the court, that the SJB bill changed, sought to change the delegation of executive power from the president to the president and the cabinet of ministers and the president to act on the advice of the prime minister and therefore requires approval at a referendum. Now, then came the 2022, so I'm sorry, the 22nd Amendment Bill of the Government of Sri Lanka, gazetted in August. It sought to uh, re-establish the Constitutional Council. Three members of the Constitutional Council from outside Parliament would be appointed by the speaker, would be actually appointed, and there's a mistake here, appointed by the Prime President on the nomination of the Speaker in consultation with the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. Now, this, this made a crucial change. Under the 19th Amendment, these three members from outside Parliament are nominated not by the speaker, but by the joint nomination, jointly by the president, by the prime minister and the leader of the opposition. So there is a consensus, a national consensus, uh, I would say, because both the prime minister and the opposition uh, leader would agree, and they would have, they have to consult all the parties in parliament, and the three people were nominated. We had under the 17th Amendment as well as the 19th Amendment. But the 22nd Amendment proposed that it be given, the power be given to the Speaker. And uh, I, some of you may have read, uh, seen, my, seen my article on this. Uh, I warned that this is, this is a very dangerous thing because the Speaker can be partisan and most Speakers have been partisan. And then, therefore, the three people from outside Parliament can be actually nominees of the government. But fortunately, I will take this opportunity to mention that also the opposition parties took a stand and said, we will not support the third, 22nd Amendment unless you change this. And the government was forced to change uh, that back to the position that was un under the 19th Amendment. And in this regard, I must say that the civil society organizations failed to raise this issue. Uh, it, it, was, it is to the credit of the opposition parties uh, to have raised this and made made made, made a change con conditional to their support to their support of the 22nd bill and that must be applauded. So the president would hold the Ministry of Defense, necessarily hold the Ministry of Defense, and assign to any assign to himself any other subject or function on the Prime Minister's advice. Prime Minister's advice being brought in. The Prime Minister cannot be removed by the President according to the bill. 
and ministers and deputy ministers would have would be appointed on the advice of the prime minister now what did the court say about it what did the court say the court adopted the delegation and alienation test that i referred to earlier and held and applying the test held that the ref, that a referendum would be needed if the president should not have the power to remove the prime minister if the president must act on the prime minister's advice in appointing ministers and deputy ministers or in assigning subjects to the president himself or changing subjects of ministers a referendum would be needed not two thirds majority alone and in the 19th amendment there was a provision to say that members of commissions recommend independent commissions recommended by the constitutional council if they are not appointed by the president within 14 days they are deemed to have been appointed now this 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 was inserted because of a particular incident that happened i mean uh, in in under the 17th amendment when a former judge of the supreme court was nominated by the constitutional council to be the chairman of the election commission president kumar tonga refused to appoint him the the constitutional council said no we are not changing that position and there was no election commission for a few years and when therefore when the 19th amendment was drafted i was a member of the drafting committee we included this uh, 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 requirement that there would be that if the president does not appoint within 14 days members are deemed to have been appointed and that was generally welcome and now the supreme court says in 2022 that the for that deeming provision to be included it must be approved by the people at a referendum now these three is these three or four issues that i mentioned here requiring a referendum according to the supreme court were included in the 19th amendment and passed and the supreme court in 2015 did not require that they re, that they, that a referendum was needed they did not hold that a referendum was needed but the supreme court in 2022 took a sub different view now i say with great respect that the supreme court seriously erred in holding that the that these provisions require a referendum both in the Uh, 20 uh, sjb bill and the government bill and the and the supreme court did not consider the legal, legislative history of article 4 and article also of article 30 not being entrenched they were not considered by the supreme court there is no reference in the judgment so no discussion rather of the legislative history of article 4 and article and of article 30 not being entrenched that crucial article which deals with the executive presidency except presidential form of government not been entrenched was not considered and ruled on by the supreme court now i submit that it is necessary to distinguish between organs of government and institutions of government within a particular organ of government there can be several institutions of government and changing those institutions as long as sovereignty is not adversely affected i put a caveat i mean not any change but as long as sovereignty is not adversely affected must be permitted without a referendum example let us say we want to have a second chamber of parliament now if the second chamber of parliament members are to be appointed nominated by the president then obviously that can't be allowed without a referendum because it affects sovereignty because it's not the people who are elect in the second chamber and to give legislative power even to a limited extent to a second chamber would adversely affect sovereignty but if the second chamber is elect members of the second chamber are elected by the people directly as in the united states or indirectly through say the like the state assemblies in india through provincial councils which are themselves elected then it's a different story because then sovereignty is not affected because they are directly or indirectly elected by the people but the supreme court decision would not even allow that and not all changes across organs of government do necessarily impact uh, on sovereignty not necessarily take an example 
Now, Article 4, this, art, this part of Article 4 is not, is not known much, at least to people outside the legal community or, or the students of political science. Arti under Article 4, Parliament may exercise judicial power in relation to parliamentary privileges, powers and privileges. It has certain judicial powers. The Supreme Court now assumed that a constitutional amendment is brought to take away that judicial power away from parliament and give it to the judiciary only. So that judicial power will be exercised even in relation to parliamentary privilege by the Supreme Court or the judiciary only, which is an obvious strengthening of sovereignty. It is an obvious strengthening of power, sovereignty. Taking away judicial power of parliament and giving to the judiciary is an obvious strengthening of sovereignty. But according to the Supreme Court decision, these two tests that they formulated, that will not, that will require a referendum, not by a two-thirds majority, but would require a referendum. And also the Supreme Court's holding that the, the removal of the prime minister is essential to executive power, that it is not a defining and essential character of the executive. I say, in my, my submission is that the removal of the prime minister is not essential to the executive power. It's not a defining and essential character of the executive. International experience is otherwise. I've referred to, I'm in, a, I'm in a forthcoming article, I'm referring to, I, 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 I took the, uh, I used the democracy index of 19, 2022 which is widely accepted. And I took the first 30, 30 countries in that list, the first 30 countries. And out of them, I think there are six or seven presidential systems, countries where the system is presidential. And in none of them can the president, prime minister be removed by the president at will. Either the prime minister is removable only by the legislature or there are certain safeguards like consultations, in, in the Portugal case, in the constitution, uh, the Portugal constitution said the president can remove the prime minister, but only after having consultations with an advisory body, which is called the, uh, I think it's called the state council, council of state. So there are safeguards. But the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka says the removal of the prime minister is essential to executive power. Now, finally, my last slide. I, I submit respectfully that the Supreme Court decisions have made this, our constitution a very rigid one, very difficult to change. A constitution must neither be too rigid, must, must not be too rigid or too flexible. It should not be too rigid or too flexible. Now, referendum people, there may be people who say what referendum is good, having a referendum is good. But referendums are firstly costly, and especially in developing countries like ours, a referendum may become one, actually a referendum on a constitutional amendment may become a, become a referendum on the performance of the government rather than on the constitutional amendment itself. So making a constitution too rigid leads to frustration among those who yearn for change. And then people will ask, why do you want to have follow this constitution? Why can't we go outside the constitution and uh, have a new constitution, which I've, all, which I've always advised against. But it, this type of make, this, this rigidity that the Supreme Court has given to the present constitution gives support for those who want, who clamor for extra constitutional constitutional change. That is, go outside the constitution and change the constitution like we did in 1972. In 1972, all 157 MPs of that parliament, including the opposition party, the UNP, the Federal Party, Tamil Congress, everybody, and the United Front, which was in power, they all came together to adopt a new constitution. But what happened? Halfway through, the Tamil members discontinued participation. The UNP did not vote. And the constitution only survived six years, a mere six years. 
And the constitution of 1972 was a majoritarian constitution, and it also undermined, we can go into details if we want to later, undermine the rule of law and democratic governance. So therefore, there is danger in using methods outside the constitution because the ex experience is that they can lead to majoritarian rule and undermining of the rule of law as we saw in 1972. So I conclude by saying that the Supreme Court's decision on the 19th Amendment in 2005, is 2015 rather, is preferable to the, their decisions in 2022. And the Supreme Court must be in, in, the, in, in the future, in an appropriate case, persuaded to change his decisions, to change his decision and at least go back to the 19th Amendment decision. And in this case, in, in, in this regard, there is a duty by the legal community to intervene in the discourse and I don't see that happening. Very few people have spoken out, discussed this issue, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very frustrated that the legal community, especially the legal academics, have not uh, come out in speaking out on this, either for or against, so that there would be a discourse on this issue. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. Thanks, Dr. Kumarana. Um, yeah, with regard to this particular amendment, uh, there was not much of a discussion in the last forum about its negative and positive aspects. I mean, uh, it is good to know that uh, there are certain parts which are positive and certain, obviously there are uh, issues uh, that will be affecting the whole country in a negative way. Um, uh, if there are any questions or comments, please... Uh, there is a question. Yeah, Anna. yeah. I'll, I'll ask those. Anonymous only. attendee says, Dr. Vikramaratha, why didn't you oppose RW, meaning Ranil Vikram Singh and Basil sitting in parliament in contradiction to the constitution? Yeah, it is no, posed by an anonymous the, attendee. Under the, under the, and under the 19th by... Amendment, Basil could not be in parliament because under the 19th Amendment, dual citizens were barred from sitting in parliament. And that provision was that even the opposition voted for it. There is no issue of Ryan Vikramasinghe and Basil sitting in parliament in contradiction to the constitution. If you're asking, okay, I can understand. If you're, if you're asking why uh, Ranil or Basil uh, nominated, they are, uh, they're being nominated to the national list. I get your point, Mr. Anonymous attendee, uh, Mr. or Mrs., whoever. I get your point now. What you say is, how could Ranil and Basil be appointed to fill the national list, uh, to be in, in the national list? In Ranil's case, it is permissible because the constitution says that uh, anybody who was in, in any of the provincial district list could be appointed. But Basil came from outside and you have a point, but that is permissible because there has been an amendment of the Parliamentary Elections Act in 1999, I believe, uh, which allows anybody from outside to be brought through the national list. Now, that is against the Constitution. I agree with you. That is inconsistent with the Constitution. But in our country, because there is no post enactment judicial review, nothing can be done about it. This issue was challenged. This issue was raised by the CPA in an application against Mr. Sarath Fonseca, uh, uh, Field Marshal Sarath Fonseca, when he was nominated. And the Supreme Court held that uh, that is possible because, that, because of that amendment uh, to the uh, Elections uh, Act. Unfortunately, uh, it was not, it was uh, uh, because we don't have Supreme uh, Post Enactment Judicial Review, that is possible. And I agree with you that it should, be, uh, should not be the case that people who are no, not nominated on the district list, on a district list or a, on, the, on the national list should, could, could be brought in to fill a vacancy in the national list. Then uh, Mr. Upali Jeeva then says, wasn't this provision made in the Yahapalane unworkable? Mr. Jeeva, if you can tell me what provision? Uh, he has clarified inability of the executive to remove prime minister. No, I think, I. I I think the matter, the, ex the 
the now the the prime minister is the person who commands the confidence of parliament so as long as the president sorry as long as the prime minister commands the confidence of parliament he should not be removable by from somebody from outside it, it it goes against the whole concept of parliamentary democracy sovereignty because people elect the parliament and peop, and the per person the mp who the mp there's only one mp the mp the constitution says the mp shall be nominated and he can't be removed he should not be able to be removed but the 1972 constitution allows this and although the supreme although the constitution 19th amendment uh, allowed it mr sirisena uh, in uh, 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 removed ranil vikram singh and the court of appeal stopped it the court of appeal uh, 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 went into this whole issue and when mahindra rajapaksa was uh, uh, when mahindra i mean indirectly stopped it in the sense that when mahindra rajapaksa found himself without a majority uh, and he was outvoted a few times the court of appeal stopped him from prevented him from acting uh, as prime minister now mr at, uh, anonymous said and he says because of the heavy legal jargon yes i agree average people feel that any discussion about the constitution is relevant to uh, what can we do to ensure average people understand the concepts that they are they may, can make informed decisions as a very good question one thing is that if as in south africa the constitution we must make the constitution uh, as simple as possible in ordinary i mean in a language in language use language that is that is easily understandable and in fact when we were doing the 2000 constitution we tried to do that to some extent but of course the 2000 constitution that never became law so i agree i mean then of course that is not enough there must be discussion there that is what i say the lawyers political scientists academics we have all have a duty and i think we are doing doing that duty part of that duty today here uh, to talk to the people to, to 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 inform the people about this constitutional issues i agree that legal jargon uh, you know most people don't understand these issues so it's 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 a matter not only the legal community but everybody including all of us to discuss these issues with the people thank you um, anybody else who would like to uh, uh, raise brief questions or comments feel free to do so we have another two three there minutes. is another question lionel by the same uh, participant anonymous attendee dr vikramada what is your view should be the composition of the constitutional council i think the constitutional council composition as as far as i am concerned we should go back to what was in the 17th amendment which was a civil society initiative i also happen to be involved in the drafting of the final uh, amendment but credit must go to the civil society not to anybody not even the politicians because it was uh, by the the organization of professional association various associations push for it uh, and ideally uh, we, uh, the constitutional council should have more people from outside out of the 10 earlier it was seven from outside three from three members of parliament that was changed in the 19th amendment also a bill the bill uh, provided for only three from members of parliament but then in parliament when in the committee stage mr vasudevan nanakar i remember and another couple of others uh, said no it must be the other way about there should be more mps and less there should, and less from outside and as the government was forced to accept it because they did not have a two thirds majority so my 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 short answer is ideally we should go back to the 17th amendment as regards the composition of the constitutional council thank you thank you dr kumaratna i will allow one more question but there is a person uh, i think uh, it must be a lady marina i because you haven't uh, now what happened Oh, what happened to that lady give me a second i'm just trying to trace her. marina uh, she has raised uh, over the hand marina do you want to still raise the question raise a question if so please raise your hand i have to allow you to talk uh, otherwise you can't talk because this is a webinar where you know 
I have to allow anybody to talk. No, okay. So we are moving on to the next item. Thank you, Dr. Ikramathan, again. And uh, now, uh, Professor Uyangbod has not yet joined. So we will have to move on to the next speaker. But before introducing Ms. Soraya Marika Dean as the next panelist, uh, we would like to play a five minute video, which will be, uh, I would say extremely interesting in the light of what happens currently in Sri Lanka. It is a video called Iran protests. Can they topple the regime? This video was published by The Economist. Uh, please watch it. The audio will also be interpreted in Sinhala and Tamil. Thank you. I will share it now. Give me a second. Uh, share screen. is brewing in Iran. In a country where removing your headscarf could send you to prison for years, women are now burning. It's part of a protest movement that is posing a huge threat to the country's brutal regime. I saw a video of the security forces bashing ahead of a woman against the sidewalk. They have been killing, they have been blind people, they have been beating people. The estimated average age of the protesters is 15. It's hard to see young girls dying in Iran. <laughs> I've been covering the region now for 30 years. I haven't seen anything parallel to this. You really have to go back to 1979, the Islamic Revolution, to see anything akin to a protest which has had so much traction. The successors of the revolution that founded the Islamic Republic could offer clues about how to overthrow it. for these protests to become not just an uprising, which can succeed or fail, but actually result in the toppling of the regime. We need to look at areas of change. The first is the protesters themselves. Until now, not having a leader has actually been a source of strength because there isn't a leader to arrest and uh, snuff out. But at some point they need to have coherent messages. They need to have a body perhaps which uh, the outside world can start to engage with and can be seen as a representative of a, a future Iran. In the 1979 revolution, that leader was Ayatollah Khomeini. Protesters rallied in support of his vision of creating an Islamic Republic. That gave him strength. It could be at some point that you do get a figure who emerges. You've already had spokespeople who have come out and said, our next leader, our next Khamenei, is going to be a woman. At this point, there are a few people that Iranian people look up to. Masi Ali Najad, she has been fighting this fight for eight years. She started social disobedience campaign that was about compulsory hijab. Reza Pahlavi, the son of the last king of Iran, he has some supporters among Iranians. Hamed Ismailun, a dentist and a writer in Canada. He has been very active. He has organized rallies in more than 120 cities outside Iran. One thing that might be missing from the puzzle that's pushing the revolution forward is the coalition outside Iran. And there are people there, they're ready, but they have to come together. They have to come together. Another lesson from 1979 is that regime change takes time. The protests have gone on longer pretty much than any other that has been in the uh, history of the Islamic Republic, but they've still only been there for a relatively small time compared to that of 1979. The protests that began in uh, the spring of 1978 didn't really uh, reach fruition um, for, for, until over a year. Weeks could go by with actually very little activity on the street, but there was clearly a sense that they were building up into something. You're starting to get that sense at the moment in Iran, but many young Iranians feel that they've just burnt too many bridges to go back. The level of radicalism that you're seeing on the streets now, the level of violence actually you're seeing on the streets, mobbings of policemen and of clerics, um, they've been torching uh, uh, billboards of the Supreme Leader. They're getting to a point where they know if they pull back, the regime is going to come right after them, and they can't afford to do that.
But toppling a regime doesn't just depend on the protesters. The regime itself needs to make mistakes too, like the Shah did. What really transformed the protests into revolution were kind of serious mistakes by the Shah and his security forces. Sometimes they would uh, seem to be weak and, 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 and rein back and not do very much. Other times they would overreact. There were massacres. And the security forces so far haven't committed the sort of mistakes that those of the Shah did in the run-up to the 1979 revolution. Then within the regime itself, until now, you haven't seen any major defections. I think you would need to see some within the system decide that they couldn't stand by the supreme leader and see that given the choice between the supreme leader and the Iranians, they were going to choose their own population. I think critically that has to happen within the security forces. As long as the security forces stand by the system, you know, this kind of hybrid form of clerical and military rule is, is going to sustain itself. And then I think also perhaps you need to see external powers start coming off the fence. Thank you for listening to that. Uh, I heard that uh, there was not enough volume, but I couldn't tell that was the maximum volume on the video. Uh, all right. Uh, I think, uh, Ranjit, if you could let uh, uh, Professor Vyangode in. Um, now, I will introduce uh, uh, Miss Dean. Uh, she's from Los Angeles, California. And time in California now is 2 o'clock in the morning. We really appreciate your dedication to be awake at this early hour to join this webinar. Uh, Ms. Soraya Dean is a lawyer, a motivational speaker, and a founder of the Muslim Women Speakers Movement. Being an award-winning Muslim feminist activist who is passionate about gender equality, her work is centered around defending dignity and human rights of women. She is the co-chair of the Women's Working Group of the International Religious Freedom Roundtable and was instrumental in launching the first round table in Sri Lanka. She is the author of the book, Peace Matters, which assists raising peace conscious children. Please welcome Ms. Soraya Dean. Thank you, Lionel, for this uh, opportunity. I think I am uh, really honored that I get to share the panel, be in the panel with these erudite scholars. Um, First, I must deeply thank you again for your commitment and dedication to highlight issues in Sri Lanka so that we can look forward to some meaningful change that can happen. Um, I will speak to you today as a community organizer. Uh, that didn't get mentioned in my introduction, but I am very proud to say I'm, I'm a community organizer and an activist. Um, what, um, what, has hap what we are talking today is not about what happened to Sri Lanka, but what was done to Sri Lanka. Let that really sink in. What happened, what was done to Sri Lanka? And it was done to Sri Lanka through many sources, but I want to address the people's responsibility because for a long time we have thought democracy is a spectator sport, that we can entrust our democracy to politicians who come to see us once in four years and not hear about them until they come back to us for another four years and we have been giving away our power to the people who lacked vision, who lacked a goal, who lacked clarity of what they were there to do. You know, Pluto says that the penalties for refusing to participate in politics is that we end up being governed by our inferiors. And fellow Sri Lankans, if you are listening, let us take full responsibility for our inaction, for our lack of participation. And some of us, we have participated, but this call is all about how could we participate more? Uh, and then uh, why did we enable these politicians? In order to understand why we are here, we have to also understand the root causes. Why did we enable these politicians? Did we lack a vision? Did we lack our values? That we did not, we failed to hold our politicians accountable. 
today what has happened in Sri Lanka, I remember this uh, little anecdote where when Stalin was asked about the Holodomor state sanctioned famine that led to the death of nearly 4 million Ukrainians, Stalin is believed to have said, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Today, our country is will be studied in history as a statistic, but we cannot forget the suffering, the pain, the hunger that is endured by our fellow citizens, even as we speak. So I want to address my segment under three topics. One is I want to talk about the polarity. Then I want to talk about uh, the Aragale and the leadership. And thirdly, I want to talk about us organizing and building third places so that we can effectively participate in our democracy. So there is a heightened level of polarity that's happening in Sri Lanka. Two opposites, contradiction tendencies and opinions, hostilities. This is, this is being flooded in Sri Lanka. The politicians are on one side, the people are on one side, the opposition is on the other side. There is no unity in thought or action. You know, Lord Buddha once said, hostilities don't end by hostilities. Hostilities end by ending hostilities. So fellow Sri Lankans and us, you know, it's, it's a hard place to be. You can't help but being hostile at what is being done to us. But we have to explore a better way. After all, we are a Buddhist nation. And I, I, I'm proud to say I come from a mixed heritage where my mother was a Buddhist and my father was a Muslim. So I am right in the middle of understanding how I can, how I can implement my Buddhist learning to this crisis that is unfolding. And that is critical, my friends, because the energy we send out is critical to these uh, issues that we are facing. So as we grapple with the injustices, we have to also focus on um, how can we come together in a way where there's kindness, compassion, equanimity, and joy for, for what we can achieve. We have to find common ground. And we must continue our efforts to find common ground, even as we debate and differ with each other. So let that foundational value sink in. That is critical, I believe, because the, the, the peace we are seeking to make, the results we are seeking to um, achieve cannot be beyond the people who are engaged in that. So if we have to be exemplary in what we are seeking to achieve. Second, I want to talk about the Aragale, that what happened and the leadership. And I'm thankful to Lionel for having shown that video because in that video, I noticed Lionel, there were several factors that were relevant to us in Sri Lanka. Because today our citizens who participated in that Aragalia have issued the boldest challenge to our corrupt uh, political system. They have challenged our democracy and they, are, they have given us a powerful message. But in order for us to move forward, we have to have some, um, some, some, some um, um, what would I say? We have to have some guidelines. First is that we have to have a leadership. We have to have a leadership so that people can connect and talk to and be the, 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 the protest movement can be represented. We have to have a leadership. And as we build that leadership, we have to be resilient. And that's what we saw in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in that uh, video as well. We need to be resilient because today, what we see is a hybrid police rule in Sri Lanka. As we fight that, we have to be resilient. We can't give up. And then our hope is that in this long journey to uh, to bring back, to restore democracy, transparency, and, and justice to our country, that people, more people will join us. Otherwise, this continued um, brutality of our people will continue. And then, in the hope that we can also engage international actors, 
because this, I believe what is happening in Sri Lanka cannot and might not be sustained by us alone. We need people, we need the United Nations, I might even boldly say, to intervene because every day, the fundamental rights of our people are desecrated. Yes, uh, two days ago, a friend of mine had gone to golfies to just do a silent, uh, uh, non-violent uh, meditation. They, they were hounded by police and the police had to be kept away. What is really happening? So we might need some kind of intervention if this continues to happen. So I want to then get to the third most important thing, the thing that I want to share with you today. One is that, and that is that we need to organize. We can't mobilize alone. We need to organize. Organizing, my friends, is the solution to our democratic challenges. It is not about people coming together, we give a membership or a card and, and not see that person again. That is not what we need to build. We need to organize the people to take powerful action. Um, and we have to build synergy between the people whom we are building, bringing together to organize. So what we need to do immediately is we need to organize outside of the election cycle so we can elect the people who are committed, who are genuine and who are honest. And then we can say, we have, we really, we, uh, we, we, see, we elders, we owe an apology to our youth who, to whom we have uh, handed down a country that is so deficient in democracy, but so replete with everything that is corrupt uh, and, and that is abused. So, but when we get together and if we really organize, if we take this issue to our hands, we wake up every morning with a passion for what can I do for Sri Lanka? We can, I'm sure we have hope that we can witness that politics will always not be dirty. We can do a different kind of politics. And we know this is the utmost fear of the ruling uh, party today, that there will be a different kind of politics. So in order to do this different kind of politics, let's understand that the radical element of democracy is education. It is critical to social change. And today that intelligence is being obstructed by the country's leaders. We are told to be angry at the person who protested, but not at the society and the politics and the power and the economics that created it. <laughs> this, is, this is the tragedy of our times. We are told to be angry at the people who highlighted the issue and not at the system and the people who caused it. And then what happens today, even as we speak, so many people have bought into it. They want everything to stop. They think everything is normal. But they don't understand that there lacks a vision for a better Sri Lanka. And this is the only time we can claim that vision. We can't let this opportunity slip by. Because we, we have to, if we can improve and increase good governance, and if we, we have to continue public discourse on corruption and transparency and, uh, and electing people to office who are there to serve you, not to earn from. So in, when I meant organizing, what I'm trying to say is organizing is building leadership that enables people to turn to the resources they have so that they can make that into power so that they can see the change that they want to see. They can change, turn the resources they have into the power they need to make change they want to see. So what I'm proposing in, in this the uh, idea of organizing is we create third places. We have to create third places. Because during the time of Hitler, I, was, I remember reading more than three to five people couldn't assemble. He, pro he, pro he stopped that. And today we don't know what is in store for us, Sri Lanka. Our democracy is dwindling. So we need to build third places. So th this, was a, this was a term coined by Ray Oldenburg, who was a sociologist. This is a place where people go to hang out and educate and build community. This is very critical that we do this in order for us to organize. 
here we strengthen community. When we strengthen community, our neighborhoods are strengthened. And we, we, can, we are capable of reducing and we are capable of addressing social problems that can stabilize our community. So uh, every community deserves a third place. And this would be like a little uh, coffee kiosk or a place we go to eat or the library or the park. We need people, we are calling out for people. I say people should come out and, and engage with each other and build social capital. We have lost everything, but we can't lose the social capital we have. So we need to build social capital because we are, we are automatically geared to build that. People are, we are social creatures. Don't just shut down and go back to your homes and wait for some uh, miracle to happen. The miracle is in you in the work you do, the community you're building. So, and, and, and today, another thing that we need to be mindful is that uh, we have become keyboard warriors. It's not sufficient that we just press the computer, forward an email, forward a text, and be, think that we have done our part. No, we have, to, we have to be more educated and more engaged so that we can protect ourselves from this corruption. This is critical because then when the more we are engaged and educated, we are able to spot the political maneuvering and call it out and end it. So we need old fashioned community engagement with a strategy done properly. So, we, so that we can meaningfully work with others to achieve our community goals. So let us not go to solve the problem of Sri Lanka. Let us fix to our local issues and then build our power. From that, we can build our leaders who will take a strong stand to serve our country and our communities. Uh, so he, there are also, today, uh, people are not engaged. People were not engaged. And we can't let that, uh, let that continue. So we did not see the threat to the democracy. And today it is necessary that we employ a strategy and a plan uh, to, to build this. And some of us will say, oh, we have busy schedules. We can go on the internet and catch headlines. Uh, no, that is not good enough, my friends. Yes, uh, true community engagement and investing in third places, investing in traditional gathering spaces, we have to commit to that. And this is inexpensive. This is very conversational. It unifies us. So, uh, so, so, so I, I ask you to look at this issue in a new light where we will push forward and we will go forward as, a commu as communities, as citizens, as people who have a stake in our country. And building power is being able to take action. It's not political power that we have seen. It's about, it's about communal power. And there is, a, there, there is a, a foundation to that. And I will, I, will, I will end there, but I want to finish by saying that we have to critically build relationships with others. The, reach out to 10 people, ask them what they are about and ask what, uh, what, what, what moves them and ask what their take is on the current situation and build strong relationships. And then structure. Be, with those relationships, put it to action strategically. And then again, as I can't stress enough, we don't all have to go and protest. There are so many ways we can protest. We can, we can continue to make our voices heard in so many ways, in so many forums. And this is very critical for us to do. Um, in, in, I will stop there, and if there are any questions, I would like to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dean, uh, uh, for that uh, uh, presentation. And uh, uh, you raised uh, very pertinent issues with regard to the current situation in Sri Lanka, especially with regard to the protest movement, you know, sort of uh, what needs to be thought about, what are the issues that we could address and how the civil society could uh, be empowered and so on. So I would like to open it uh, for a 10 minute discussion, a quick Q&A. Uh, now, are there any questions uh, 
on the Q&A that there is a new question by anonymous attendee. What is the best way to accommodate ethnic persecution? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's a, that is one. I will just uh, read all the questions. Then it will be easier for you to. Um, uh, Willie Senanayaka from Canberra. He is asking, Miss Saraya, you mentioned that Aragale needs a firm leadership. Yes, I agree. But where will this leadership come from? Attempt to join all recognized opposition parties to a joint protest event was not successful. I guess political parties that joined that protest had their own agendas. Any suggestion as to who could lead the Aragale towards a system change? Then there is another question that's a long one. Anonymous attendee. Dear Saraya, thank you for your commitment to meaningful change in Sri Lanka. For many decade, decades, Sri Lankan politicians have exploited differences among various communities to come into power. In my view, all religions carry the same message using different words to help people manage their day-to-day -day lives in an acceptable manner. Yes, to, yet to develop a country, as you have indicated, it is essential to have the leaders with right values, with the right vision, right policies, and right strategies, with correct planning and willing to make to take right actions for the benefit of all Sri Lankans. Question one, what can be done to ensure what, that average Sri Lankans understand that every individual, regardless of race or religion, should have equal opportunities? Question two, what values should be, we encourage development among young from an early age in Sri Lanka so that we can expect to see a better Sri Lanka in the future? So I, if you could take those three questions, there are two um, more. So. Oh, thank you. So here's the thing. I think our, our leaders are stuck in an ego battle. You know, they, they are refusing. They're unwilling to talk to one another. Uh, and this is, this is causing another level of polarity. In terms of a leadership for the Aragale, uh, it's, not, it's hard for me to propose somebody, but they have to convene and discuss and come up with a name that we need this so badly and it is one of the defining uh, moments when we watched the Aragalia, we knew that people were mobilized, but they were not organized. So we need to brainstorm the people who led the Aragalia. We know the people in the Aragalia know some potential leaders. We have to come together, build a consensus, and then have a strong leadership that can take this forward. And it, it's not even about we have to have long-term vision and a short-term vision. We, we, so we have to let focus on a short-term vision, you know, because if we don't take, organize and mobilize before the next election, the same corrupt politicians are going to be voted in. Uh, so we stand at a risk if we wait for the perfect moment. We have to get out of ourselves and, uh, and have a, have, go beyond our personal uh, vision, personal gains to the country. What? How will this country benefit? Because as I said before, I can't stress enough, this didn't happen to Sri Lanka. This was done to Sri Lanka. Who did it? How were they able to do it? How can we prevent it from being done again? Are some questions that we need to ask. Okay. So in terms of leadership, I think the people have to come together and talk and decide on a leadership. It's, it's, um, it's, it rests, it's a foundational thing that we need to do to move forward. And there are some political leaders who are very capable, who have teams that are very capable. But what we lack today in Sri Lanka is uni unity. There's so much disunity. Everybody is pointing a finger at the other and not realizing three fingers are pointing back at them. And the second component is I want to go back to this brilliant idea of third places. Don't discount it. It is so important. When you are prevented from assembling in, in public places, assemble in your community. We are not there to overthrow the government. We are there to talk about our, our country. Our democracy, how can we uh, bring forth better leaders? You have a legitimacy in, in, in assembling and talking uh, out on those issues. So I fearfully urge everybody, uh, build those third places. 
Uh, we have third places there. I mean, think of you, which is the restaurant you go to every day. You sit and you eat and you might see the same familiar faces. Build a community in that area. Talk about these issues. Next day, tell them to reach out to 10 more people, each person. And let there be a heightened mindfulness of everyone, of every each one of us, that we need to come together and build our social capital. This is critical. And in terms of education, yes, this is foundational. Educating the woman, the mother, the child uh, is critical. And then these are the things that we can push forward moving. And let it not be, let us not delude ourselves that one person, one leader is going to save our country. It is never going to happen. Let us, let us make it a communal effort that collectively we all gather to, uh, to transform our country. Thanks, thank you. Uh, so there is a comment by Professor Suresh Surendran in London. Uh, this is just a comment. Many thanks for the organizers and the speakers for making this event uh, make for this very, very useful. Ms. Soraya mentioned it is a Buddhist nation. I am disagreeing. And I am also disagreeing. <laughs> and <laughs> not sure what she meant. I would like to see Sri Lanka as a democratic country with the nation of all religions. By, by the way, not only Buddhism, but all Sri Lankan religions, including Hinduism and Christianity, and probably I will add Islam, have similar values you mentioned, regards. So, so that's, a, that's a comment. But there, is a, uh, there are two more questions. So I, uh, I don't know whether it's a comment in Tamil. And if uh, uh, Mansur, would you be able to translate this into, it is in Q&A. Uh, it is it is in the written form. Oh, Anthony, would you be able to translate this into English? It is under ten. It, it was noted. It was written in at okay. ten. Okay. How could we and um, certainly um, we need to work together? People are asking to work that we should all work together. But um, those who have been affected, just a moment. Uh, and, but people are also saying that we should give up our national ideologies. How, how, how this is possible or how can this be uh, uh, acceptable? Um, national ideologies? I, yeah, ethnic, this, you mean? Hmm. Um, anyway, to the first, uh, I think from London or Canberra, uh, she said it, it is not a Buddhist, I think, yeah, Buddhist majority nation. I kind of use it selectively because I'm, uh, Buddhism is a philosophy and we can, we can, uh, we can boldly claim that uh, to, to guide us uh, in that context, you know, it's a Buddhist majority nation. Um, and uh, what was the second question? That is the one in Tamil, but uh, yeah. I don't understand. Then I will move on to the, uh, now who has raised this question? Somebody, okay. All right, uh, I will move on to the next question until somebody get properly translated uh, the Tamil question. What is your opinion on the strengthening of people's participation and people's power through the establishment of people's councils? I think um, if you could briefly respond because we are running out of the 10 minutes. To, we have yes, to yes. the next presentation. Yeah. If there's anything I spoke about, that's about people's power today. Because we have given away our power. Mm -hmm. We have been told we are powerless and we have thought the politician has more power. Again, this didn't happen to Sri Lanka. This was done to Sri Lanka by politicians. Mm -hmm. People's councils mm -hmm. are important, but more important is grassroots mm -hmm. movements where people are will have a heightened aware of the political maneuvering that's taking place. People have a heightened awareness that this politician is elected by me and he's accountable to me. People have a heightened awareness that politics is not a spectator sport, that democracy is not a spectator sport, that we have to participate in this. As we talk, we have to think of a next youthful possible leaders for our country. No, we can't be recycling these political uh, leaders anymore. Thank you. I will just uh, quickly try to translate this into 
it's english molten for a second tamil i'm using the google translate <laughs> uh in english they demand that we should work together but they say that we should leave it when we present our national thought as the victims whichever is more appropriate so i i i can get the gist of the question so what is asking okay you are asking to work together but when we talk about our identity then you try to separate us so what has to be done mm. i think that is a yeah there's so many millions of people in sri lanka are not being heard by our politicians for years but today if we are to turn a new leaf we have to work together we have to come together and and look at these issues as sri lankans and then uh, build solidarity and then of course listen to the grievances of all minority communities and the majority community also has grievances we are an aggrieved nation because we have been mm-hmm. uh, this we have been told that we are powerless our people have been told mm-hmm. they are powerless mm-hmm. i think mm-hmm. people have the power and we have to reclaim mm-hmm. that power so i would conclude by saying mm-hmm. build those third places mm-hmm. when you go to a restaurant engage in conversation mm-hmm. and build a community there go next friday next the other following mm-hmm. friday build a community and work out a plan about how mm-hmm. we are going to keep our mm-hmm. uh, our citizens engaged and awoke and mobilized thank you mm-hmm. thank you thank you mr dean miss sorry um now uh let us go to uh, professor jaydev yangwada um he was to be the first speaker but uh, due to unavoidable circumstances he couldn't uh, take part professor yangwada actually needs no introduction he is a political scientist who writes prolifically on matters related to political developments in sri lanka particularly on matters of constitutional development he did doctoral studies at the university of hawaii and became attached to the department of political science and public policy at the university of colombo He worked with Dr. Neelam Thirichulam in drafting the Mughal Constitution in 1999. Let us welcome Professor Vyangwad. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very sorry I missed uh, uh, Dr. Jambati's presentation. And also I want to apologize for my being late. Uh, so uh, I will speak briefly about uh, two questions. sub themes under this topic one is uh, you know to kind of you know make an attempt to present some ideas about uh, how should we analyze the current situation politically so that provide the context for our theme today and also what to do in term against one in political terms i think uh, you know uh, sri lanka is uh, in a mm-hmm. new phase of uh, you know government by repression you know there's a that uh, repressive nature of the regime and the government and also the state has entered uh, seems to have entered the qualitative new phase and we need to understand that and that is because uh, actually sri lankan state has been in a very severe crisis and also the ruling class has been in a severe crisis over the past you know for uh, several months and uh, that crisis was such that there was a moment even the you know the political class was not sure they could hold on to power right somehow that they managed to reconsolidate after the mid july and there seems to have been a situation where an agreement among sections of the ruling class or so called political class to consolidate themselves politically and uh, you know reconstitute the power block and also to you know change the nature of the state so i think that's very significant and that we need to understand the, that particular dimension of what is happening to the sri lankan state today the sri lankan state uh, uh, is now under the control of a new power block that's also very important for us to keep in mind that power block as i think uh, four or five uh, components uh, one is that you know there's a coalition between uh, two leading factions of the political class that's the unp and the and sections so the leading core group of the you know porto party 
So there's a you know effective coalition, and that coalition represents a kind of a you know new unity among various sections of the divided uh, you know political class, and they lead uh, they, polit they politically lead the new power block that runs the state, Sri Lankan state, and of course there is uh, the second component of that power block that the military security establishment. They are a very powerful component of the new power block. Thirdly, uh, the business class, you know, the business class, the entrepreneurial class uh, is strongly behind uh, the new changes that are taking place in Sri Lanka. So this new power block has a kind of a, you know, task. The task is to restore the political stability of the Sri Lankan state and the government, and also restore the political credibility of the ruling class. You know, during the Aragalaya, uh, you know, that political credibility of the ruling class has been, you know, totally shaken. Even the very foundations of the Sri Lankan state had been shaken. So restoration of political stability is, I think, uh, you know, we all can see at the so one of the top priorities of the new regime, that coalition between the UNP and core groups of the Sri Lanka, you know, Padujana Perumuna. So then Sri Lankan, uh, you know, the response that uh, the ruling groups seems to have formulated is also a response to Aragalaya. You see, the Aragalaya in a way, not only shaken the ruling, ruling elites, but also it has, uh, you know, demonstrated that they have to restructure and rebuild the relationship between the state and society. So that's why there's a new process in Sri Lanka, which I call a synthesis of what tradition, what we traditionally called militarization. I mean, that was the term used to describe the uh, the nature of the style, nature and style of the regime under the previous president, Mr. Gota Bay Rajapaksha. That militarization process is going on. Now there is an extremely uh, disturbing new dimension, which I call securitization of the state, securitization of the government, securitization of the government policies, public policies, Fourth dimension is securitization of the state, society, state, citizen relations. What is securitization? What is specific about it? Securitization is a term that we use to describe the particular attitude of the state or government or the political class or the ruling elite or the bureaucracy to the state society relations and also nature of the state. That attitude says that the what is called national security should be given precedence over anything else. You know, the term national security is a highly loaded term. You know, it says, you know, the terms like state security, public security all are also part of this notion of national security. So the security establishment, right? And top bureaucracy of the defense establishment and also intelligence establishment, they are the key, you know, uh, in institutions in this whole new securitization of apparatus, securitization apparatus that is happening in Sri Lanka. So they are a powerful component of the new power block, right? So the, everything is measured, evaluated, and responded to, responded to from the point of view of the national security, right? Citizens are, all citizens are under suspicion because any citizen can be any moment a threat to national security. That's why demonstrations, citizens organization, mobilization, demonstrations, protests are today seen as not an exercise in the fundamental rights guaranteed under the you know, fundamental rights chapter of the constitution, 
but a threat to national security. That is why you may have seen during the past several weeks, except the uh, 2nd of November protests, in all the protests, the way the police was deployed, actually the police was wearing almost military uniforms. It's not like, uh, you know, the Sri Lankan police that we have, uh, you know, we are used to seeing in the, see in the past, almost like in Latin American countries. In many Latin American countries, the police wear military type uniforms. The police came to confront the unarmed protesters as if they were meeting or confronting um, armed resistance or armed challenge to the state. So that is securitization. You know, the police is no longer a civilian law and order force in Sri Lanka, actually. Police is constantly being deployed, you know, as a, as a force that should protect the state from the threat of the citizens, unarmed citizens. That is what's called securitization. So when we talk about, uh, you know, repression today, it's extremely important for us to recognize that today's repression, what we call repression, is not an ordinary affair. It's a specific development. And why is it that specific development, what I, why has it taken place? But the specific development because of this crisis of the state, which has been exacerbated, exacerbated by the Aragale itself. Tragically and paradoxically, the current wave of militarization or the securitization of the state, government, public policy, state responses are also continuing response to Aragale, right? So government responses have not ceased to exist. You know, there's a continuing reinvention of that government response in security terms. So that is, I think, the, the you know, it's disturbing, but it's important for us to recognize that reality. That are those, that those are the things that define the current context in Sri Lanka. It's not the old style of, you know, violation of human rights. Very similar to what happened in the Northeast, actually, during the past 30 years. Very similar to that. So, all securitization and militarization. So, we have, here we have, one may even call a softer version of that, what happened in the North and East. But, you know, nevertheless, it's securitization and part of militarization. So, that is why... It's also important, you know, when we think about how to, you know, how to combat uh, this new situation and how to how to protect human rights. You know, a restoration of democracy as a replacement of the securitized state. You know, it's very important. You say that, so democratization struggle for democratization is also has 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 once again come to occupy the center of political agenda in sri lanka so sri lankan society today is polarized as soraya said you know there are a lot of divisions and there are two types of polarization in sri lankan society today right one set of polarization is at one level there is this ruling class or political you know or process that is uh, led by the ruling class or leading sections of the political class to consolidate their power not within a framework of democracy but within a framework of securitized post-democratic state model. You know, that is happening. Actually, uh, the economic crisis has also given enough justification for that. And we can talk about it later. That's one side. So the highly, you know, highly securitized, securitized state form is evolving in Sri Lanka. That's one side of the spectrum. The other side of the spectrum is the popular demand for greater democracy. To bring the democratic process back, actually to advance, take forward, 
what one may call the democratic revolution that began early this year. So these are the two poles in Sri Lanka's, you know, the political divide at the moment. So Sri Lanka society politically sharply divided along those two lines. The other level of polarization is on the question of democracy itself. You know, Sri Lankan society seem to be having two classes of people at the moment, or two main camps from the point of view of democracy. Camp one wants either no democracy at all or little democracy. Right? That's camp one. Yeah, the camp two, the vast majority of citizens in the country need more democracy. They are warned, they want, they demand more democracy. So there are two classes of people in Sri Lanka. One class wanting more, no democracy or little democracy and a large class of people wanting more democracy and more democracy. So this, you know, uh, the, the society is polarized along these two axes. Politics will be shaped by the way in which these contradictions would be resolved. Actually, the ruling class or the ruling political class is trying to resolve these contradictions by undemocratic means through repression, because securitization is their approach to resolving this fundamental contradiction that they see in Sri Lanka. So what is the <clears throat> what is the proposal from the point of view of citizens to resolve this crisis in favor of democracy? And that's the question we have to pose. Actually, Sri Lanka's Aragalaya, after its first phase, is actually confronting this very severe, very serious challenge. What would be the political character of the Aragalaya in the second phase? I don't think that question has been really addressed even by Aragalaya participants in Sri Lanka. There is a you know, debate going on how to, or a lot of discussions going on how to take this process forward. But I think, you know, it, it would be extremely important for to defend Sri Lanka's democracy, rule of law, human rights, and also to fight repression, to re-establish a broad coalition of democrats in Sri Lanka, right? That coalition would have will have to be a social coalition, a political coalition, and as well as an inter-ethnic coalition. Right? It's a three dimensions of that broad democratic coalition. The social, in terms of social classes, right? Working class, the peasantry, the middle classes, right? It's a broad multi-class coalition that we saw that during the Aragalaya, the actual Aragalaya, you know, participants represented all these social classes. It was a multi-class, you know, broadly pluralistic, you know, in terms of its social com composition. So Aragalaya has given us a kind of a model in terms of the social composition of a broad democratic mm -hmm. culture, a multi-plural and. A, Plural in social terms, you know, multi-class is also another way of saying it. It has to be broadly yes. democratic in terms uh, of you, political if, composition. If you could wind up in a minute or so. Oh, yeah, yeah I'll do that. Right, uh, that broad coalition. I think uh, the next year, the year 2023, is likely to open up a new, you know, uh, space for democratic forces to consolidate the struggle for democracy in a variety of ways. One is that, you know, democratic means most probably elections are coming up, some elections are coming up, right? The government is trying to postpone them, but nevertheless, I think very important to think about seriously how to creatively make use of the democratic space and opportunities opened by the political process to consolidate such a broad 
democratic coalition. I think uh, that is the most important precondition to defend Sri Lanka's democracy, rule of law, and continue to fight against repression. I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor Yangudu. That's yeah. a very insightful analysis of the current situation. Uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, you know, sort of, sir, we have to make use of the current, uh, whatever the opportunities that are available to open up more space, more democratic space, and try to use it for empowering the people. And uh, now I will limit this, uh, the Q&A, although we have said that it's 10 minutes, but I will limit it to three questions. If you have any questions, please uh, uh, post this on Q&A or chat line. Or if you want to uh, talk, uh, it has to be less than three minutes, your comment or well, I can allow you to talk. Anybody? Willie really has asked a question uh, <clears throat> from Canberra. Uyan, what is your opinion on your uh, on the role currently played by main left political party, the JVP and PP? Are they reluctant to form a broad political alliance to strengthen the Araga layer because they think it would weaken their dream of winning a parliamentary majority at the next election? Uh, okay, then there is uh, another question by an anonymous attendee. A Tamil militant leader who was killed in Valikad in 1983 massacre stated that the doc, when he was sentenced to death, that horror of prevention of terrorism act will turn against the oppressed section in the oppressor nation. Yes, PTA is one extreme, but securitization through intelligence network and paramilitary activism can extend the oppression and enforce disappearances that we saw in 88-89 period. How can we stop this disaster? Then there is another question by Firdus. Uh, in a country which has no democratic framework within the party system, how to start the democratic initiative? There is uh, Arjuna Ranavana posing a question. I think he's from the States. How does securitization affect freedom of expression? Freedom of? So those freedom of expression, expression, freedom of speech. Oh, freedom of speech. Okay. Yeah, so there are those three questions and I will leave it at that. Yeah, yeah those are actually very important questions. Uh, the first question, you know, uh, it's uh, unfortunately and paradoxically, both the JVP and the Frontline Socialist Party are not in a position at the moment to even to talk to each other. So that's a very sad dimension of the present situation. Actually, I have written about it. Well, that's one of my articles in the Sinhala today in Anidda is on exactly on that topic, uh, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, they don't seem to be uh, thinking of how to resolve their contradictions, you know, contradictions in a friendly manner, you know, and that could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the major negative aspects of uh, any further progress of uh, you know, citizens are uh, You know, I think, uh, you know, those who want to take the struggle for democratization forward, I think will have to bring a lot of pressure on both FSP and the JVP uh, to, you know, think a little differently as the, you know, the, the, the question itself has you know, it's a lot of interesting assumptions and, you know, it's very important. Otherwise, it will be very destructive. I mean, the consequences of this, uh, you know, factional struggle between the two ex-comrades, <laughs> that's one. Uh, and on Arjuna's question, last question, Arjuna, I think uh, uh, freedom of the expression, freedom of expression would certainly be a victim of, uh, you know, enhanced, and increase securitization of the government and securitization of the state and securitization of state society relations. Government has already started talking about restricting uh, the scope of freedom available to the social media. Uh, you know, you never know, they might be even, you know, preparing draft legislation. So we have to expect 
you know, restrictions, severe restrictions on freedom of expression, freedom of association, uh, like we have been observing last, uh, you know, couple of months. And what, Comrade uh, what is the second and third question? I mm, uh, feel those uh, from uh, Melbourne. He's asking, in a country which has no democratic framework within the party system, how could we start the, a democratic initiative? I think uh, the, 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 there is a question in Tamil as well. It is quite similar. Sort of uh, what he's asking is, uh, how can we unite when there are so many security measures? So it's, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think most of the demo political parties in Sri Lanka are, und are undemocratic because there's no internal party democracy, and the political parties have also been, you know, captured by elites, you know, very you know corrupt political elites. So unfortunately, we have a situation where political parties. Theoretically, uh, the democratic link between the citizens and the state, but political parties themselves are not democratic. So that's one of the, what I call a part of the crisis of representative democracy in Sri Lanka. And it was highlighted dramatically during the, uh, during uh, the Aragalaya as well. I think one of the key slogans of Aragalaya, two slogans, system change and a new political culture. Both these slogans, were, you know, concerned with this, you know, decay of political parties and also the political class in democratic sense. So it's a, that's why I think this, uh, you know, I, you know, I have been using this term re-democratization. Actually, Sri Lanka, the Aragalaya highlighted a very important point. That is that we, Sri Lanka needs not returning to kind of all form of parliamentary democracy, but re-democratization, right? We have to reimagine, you know, what kind of democracy we need in Sri Lanka at every sphere, I think democratization, public sphere, the personal sphere, social sphere, you know, gender relations, you know, everywhere, you know, uh, overall democratization, uh, imagination is needed. I think Aragale highlighted it. Uh, so that is why uh, Sri Lanka also will have to think about, you know, all of us in Sri Lanka will have to think about, uh, you know, how to get some of the best legacies of Sri Lanka's modernity and also traditions. And Soraya was talking about, you know, the, the question about religion. And the, I think all, re, all religions, also have a very strong element of tolerance huh? and social peace. So those are also the elements that we have to bring in for a kind of, a, you know, local, you know, multicultural, pluralistic notion of democracy, not necessarily the Western notion of liberal democracy, you know. And also, we also have to think about, uh, begin to talk about economic democracy in Sri Lanka, because the IMF inspired economic you know, recovery program is going to create two very, very crucial, unfortunate consequences. One is that there will be greater, you know, spread of poverty among Sri Lankan citizens. You know, the poor will be, become poorer and the middle classes will be taxed for the rec economic recovery in the coming months. So there'll be greater level of economic polarization in Sri Lankan society, greater spread of poverty. And also tremendous disparities in economic, you know, wealth, economic distribution, even consumption, you know, food consumption, that will be tremendous level of disparities in Sri Lankan society once this IMF inspired, you know, economic recovery program is implemented because it will pass the burden of economic recovery onto the poor, onto the middle classes. Right. So we have to, you know, when I, when I raise that question, what kind of democracy do we need in Sri Lanka? I think economic democracy and social democracy are also two very important dimensions of the kind of democracy Sri Lanka needs to recover from the current, you know, this profound crisis. Not only civil and political rights. I think one of the one of the one of the shortcomings of the civil society movement in Sri Lanka for democracy is that they have been primarily focusing on 
civil and political rights right but that phase of sri lanka's democratic history i think is is gone now we have to bring broaden broaden democracy democracy and deepen <laughs> you know these are both very important dimensions of a re democratization agenda that's why the conversation has to be you know uh, deepen to our democratic conversation so that's one way to have some impact on the jvp and frontline socialist party also to you know uh, join hands with other democratic forces in the country thank you okay okay thank you thank you professor viyambara uh, we will move on to our final speaker uh, tonight uh, Mr. Upali Jayasuri, a well-known in professional circles and also in the legal fraternity in Sri Lanka. Mr. Jayasuri is a former president of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Due to his professional work for improving the rule of law situation in Sri Lanka, there were occasions when his life was in danger. He was presented with the 2015 Rule of Law Award of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association in Glasgow, which came with a cash donation of 5,000 US dollars. He generously donated that sum to the wife of late journalist Prigit Technaligode, who was murdered in 2010. Mr. Jayasuriya stood up against injustices with the intent of protecting democratic values amidst the current dreadful situation the country finds itself in. He appeared before courts to represent many protesters whose fundamental rights had been violated. He also served as the chairperson of the Board of Investment of Sri Lanka. I have great pleasure in inviting Mr. Jai Surya to share his views. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Lionel, for the introduction. I hope I'm audible to all the participants. I yes. believe so. Thank you. Uh, well, we are talking about the democratic process in Sri Lanka. Well, to begin with, I must confess that I'm not an academic nor an analyst. Uh, I've been a lawyer all my profession, uh, professional life for the last nearly 46 years. So I've been in the forefront of uh, some of the struggles that we have had from about 2000 and um, maybe 2012. That's the time of the, uh, her leadership, Shirani Bhattana like, have been uh, sought to be restrained from discharging her duties. Now we are faced with a different problem with regard to the, the democratic rights being stifled by the ruling uh, government. And uh, uh, the, the, the protest that we are all talking about, which we saw in the last several months, uh, is something that is applauded by the entire world, and also not only by the entire world, but mostly by the, uh, the, the national loving citizens of Sri Lanka. Now, uh, they are, now the government is now trying to push them into the doghouse, uh, very unfortunately. Uh, now, uh, what, what are we talking about democracy, democratic rights? They should have the freedom of expression, freedom of association. Uh, these are the uh, rights that are enshrined and also the uh, core conventions that are to be honored by the uh, EU in the granting of uh, the GSP plus, uh, which are now threatened again because we are losing uh, the, the, the rights that we had with regard to these core conventions. So we are in the uh, eve of even, hopefully not, but we, are, we may be losing the EU uh, G GSP plus facility at, uh, as a country. So that, that's another dreadful situation because we as a country are very much reliant on the, the government sector exports and the, uh, the revenue that we generate from the government sector, though the contrib contribution to the GDP from the government sector is only about uh, 15 to 20 percent because most of the inputs are all important. Now, in, in fact, I was uh, I saw in the in the news breaking from Colombo today, right at the moment I'm in Australia uh, for a short time. I'll be uh, attending the Law Asia conference. Uh, that the expert community, community the uh, the inward remittances of expert community for the month of October has risen to 355 million dollars and for the entire year up to uh, October 31st we have received some 2.9 billion say roughly say three billion dollars but 
uh, one year ago, before this crisis has uh, set into the society in Sri Lanka, we have had about nearly seven and a half billion dollars coming into the country. Now, I saw the, the other day when one party was asked about a, a prominent party, emerging party that was asked about their uh, economic policy, about uh, how are you going to solve this economic problem in the country? Uh, uh, they, they were suggesting that they were going to ask the expert community to send $500 more, each individually to send $500 more into the country. So I was a bit shaken and taken aback about the kind of solution uh, that they were proposing, particularly in view of the fact that they are seeking to uh, come to power. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at from a practical point of view, as I said earlier, not a constitutional analyst, nor a social analyst like Professor Uyangkuta, whose ideas that were expressed were, are very much appreciated and valued. Uh, we are in a situation to pause for a moment to see what has gone wrong. Are we living in a democracy? Now, we were hearing about the securitization, the militarization, I call it. The few days ago, the president, Victor Masinga, came to the parliament and made an announcement under the public security ordinance that he has promulgated the deployment of all the forces, army, navy, and air force, uh, to be brought in to police the country. So this is in addition to the police force that is there. So in fact, the, uh, just this uh, noon, I was uh, going through the city of Melbourne. I would like to share with you a uh, video. Now this is what I saw. Uh, uh, there was a protest. The, this was at a cross section. Uh, the, the tram cars were all stopped from different directions. I was intrigued to see whether there was this our uh, genial DIG telephone was anyway around because if he was around, he would have stopped the, uh, this uh, with some armed forces and then uh, dumped them into some trucks and then taken them away. Whereas police were giving them protection and protecting the public and protecting the protesters, all of whom. So this is the democratic values and the principles that we want respected in our country, which we don't see. So we have to uh, pause for a moment to see what has gone wrong. Now, the other, uh, Professor Yankara was also commenting on the, the, the disappointment of various groups of people, professionals, but I must say, being a lawyer myself, I'm proud of the legal profession. That's the only profession that has come forward, uh, irrespective of the party, uh, uh, different views that they may be having political views that they may be possessed with, they have come forward and uh, without any division, they have been unanim with unanimity, they have stood by the democratic rights. So that is something to be applauded. But in the meantime, we started, we, we witnessed a situation in the country with the, with the incoming of the new government in 2019. In the manifesto, in the first cabinet meeting that they held, up to the, uh, the soon after the, the general election that was held, they proposed a tax cut, a tax cut. 681 billion was the tax cut as was st stated by the central bank, but the other economists say it's much more than that. Now for the entire construction industry, we had to give we had to uh, pay most of the contractors that have done their job. They had to be paid uh, something like 150 billion rupees. They are not being paid. As a result of which we have today more than 1 million construction workers who are jobless, who are jobless. Entire travel industry, uh, hotel workers, the employees, the travel companies, there are more than three to 400,000 people who are jobless. In addition to that, we have a situation where the cost of living, uh, I, I think the Lebanon is supposed to be higher than Sri Lanka, but I don't know whether who is higher, but whichever, the central, according to central bank figures, our inflation rate is 
80 to 90 percent. So with jobs lost and the incomes lost, we have to pay a higher price. And according to the UN uh, analysis, at least uh, two out of three children are going through malnutrition. So this is what Dharagali is about. Those children who got onto the road and uh, scream for justice, they, scream, they saw it happening to their own parents. They are not from affluent families. Their parents are struggling to make their ends meet. They have to find the food, they have to find the bus fares, they have to find the educational or the expenses. It's very good that we discuss about the historical and the present and the future of our constitution. It's needed, it's important. But in, in the meantime, we must find a solution to this. In, in making an attempt to find the solution, we must also analyze to see where we have gone wrong. Where we have gone wrong. If we are to put the future right, we must study from the past and then make it a point that the future will not go wrong back again. Now, as I told you, this 681 billion rupees that was lost to the coffers of the government, uh, that was done on an arbitrary decision, not by law. The law was brought in in August 2020. So until such time, it was a totally arbitrary decision by the cabinet. They sought to implement it as a result of which we lost the revenue. But even afterwards, they brought in the law and uh, we lost the revenue up to now. So this is one of the reasons why, as uh, it was said by Edmund Burke, the triumph of the evil is for good men to be signed. So I think legal position has, from time and again, from time to time, wherever possible, have taken up these matters before the apex court of the country. And here in this instance too, we filed a matter, I appeared in that matter, uh, against the, the two governors, that is Dr. Lashman, uh, Nivad Kabra, and uh, P.B. Jayasundra, and uh, the entire cabinet that was there at that time when they took these decisions, arbitrary decisions, President uh, Rajapaksa, President uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa, uh, Minister of Finance, uh, brought up by the Basil Rajapaksa, all of them. Um, I'm very happy that about the response of the Supreme Court. They not only granted uh, leave to proceed in the matter, and they have granted so many uh, interim relief, wherein they have ordered the Auditor General of the country to examine and report to the Supreme Court by the 6th of January, the loss that we have incurred by the, the pegging of the US dollar as 203 rupees, secondly, by the delay in going to the IMF, uh, and, and, and another matter which I can't remember exactly, uh, to uh, audit and then report back to the Supreme Court. So we are happy about the response and also court has or also ordered uh, the th uh, three or four of them, particularly the, the trio, the three musketeers, the Rajapaksas, uh, prohibited them from going abroad. Uh, their passports have been impounded. And we have also, uh, in the meantime, uh, petitioned the bribery commission and sought relief from the Supreme Court that the bribery commission should be directed to inquire into these matters and then report back to the Supreme Court within a matter of three months, which will be decided at the end of the, uh, end of the, the, the argument. Uh, the matter was taken up before a additional bench of five judges, not three, and the matter was argued for at the, uh, the interim stage of granting leave to argue for 12 days. And we are very happy about the response. So this, we had to find out, study from the past where we have gone wrong. And then only, these people, the entire world, the entire community in Sri Lanka is crying to punish the wrongdoers. And then there is also another cry that the stolen money should be brought back to the system. It can be done. It has to be done. But I do not know whether the bribery commission has the wherewithal or the intelligence or the, the, the expert uh, approach that they should be possessed with 
in examining these matters, in uh, making an attempt to bring these monies back to the country. Because under Section 70, whenever of the Bribery and uh, Corruption Commission law, there is, whenever there is a loss incurred by the government or by a person, then that is corruption. Because they have, that is why we have, because we are content that this to be corruption. Because the other experience that I have is, with regard to the ball matter, we have been IF here in the Supreme Court, we have petitioned the, uh, the primary commission. That was 12 years ago. 12 years ago. Up to now, they have taken no action. They have taken no action. But in this instance too, they have asked the uh, people to come and then uh, st recording statements and all that is taking, uh, supposed to be taking uh, taking effect. But I don't know how far they will go. That is why we have uh, sought order. Now, when in, uh, the, the first ingredient of democracy is rule of law. Do we have rule of law in our country? As this government came into power, 700 police officers of the CID who were investigating all important matters, particularly sensitive matters, political sensitive matters, their passports were impounded. Just there was one person, that is, I think, Inspector SP Nishanta Silva, he managed to get out of the country. But the other person who was responsible for most of these uh, investigations was remanded, were hounded out, were interdicted, and gave all the, uh, the punishment that they could. And at this late moment, he had been ordered to be given security by the Witness Protection Authority that had not been given. And we are now to uh, bring the matter to the Court of Appeal to charge them for contempt. That again is that genial. Uh, DIG telephone. Now, these are the same men who was uh, instrumental in uh, creating that mayhem on the 9th of May, and he, he continues. The IGP is uh, powerless. So the, the rule of law is not taking place. Rule of law is not taking place. When there is some pepper that has been eaten by some uh, young chap from the president's house, he's been taken into custody and then he's kept under detention or whatever. But the people who have robbed millions and billions are roaming around spot free. No attempt is being made by anybody. The, the institutions that are vested with the power to investigate and report on these issues, are they doing their job? So we have to not only make these institutions strong, but also make these institutions accountable. It should be you now, for instance, the promotions in the judiciary is taking place automatically, rhetorically. It is just taking place on the seniority basis. Why should that be? When some of the uh, minor judicial officers that are promoted to the higher grade, maybe from a magistrate to a district judge or to a high court judge or whatever, uh, there may be so many large number of uh, cases in, on which they have heard and concluded, sometimes going on for years and years, but not that will not deliver. And they go on promotion and that same case that we heard all over again. But there is no mechanism to uh, examine their, 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 their commitment and how far they have been successful in the job that they have been holding. So we have to look at these institutions and make them stronger. Now look at the business community. When all these things were happening, when all these tax rebates were given, they they benefited out of the tax rebates that were given. What did they do? Did they say, oh, this is bad for the country's economy, this is bad for the industry, this is bad for whatever the forward march, and they did they appeal to the government to not to do it? No. They are very happy and put in the profits into the back into their pocket. What are we going through now? All because of the business community. Now they are uh, raising their cries again, saying the argument should stop. This will affect the tourism industry. This will affect that, this, and all that. But this argument, they do not. They should not forget the fact. All this started because of them, because they forgot and put away the great saying of Edmund Burke that was said in in the 17th century. Because they kept silent. That was a triumph of the evil regime. So we have gone through this. So how long are we going to tolerate this? I, I do not uh, wish to talk in length. I think my time would have come up. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, end up by 
so you were a few words from Nelson Mandela on justice. He said, recognize that the world is hungry for action, not words. Act with courage and mission. As long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality persist in our world, none of us can truly rest nor be safe. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Jasudia. <clears throat> it was enlightening in the sense that uh, you touched on many aspects of the current crisis, both uh, political and economic. And uh, you also touched on uh, many issues that relate to bribery and corruption and why we cannot curtail the situation in the country. And uh, I think uh, most of the expatriate community has been asking for uh, adopting new mechanisms to ensure to assure uh, transparency, accountability, and uh, economic mismanagement. But nothing has been done. What they are doing is just trying to export some, I think uh, I read today that they are trying to export some nurses you know, to other countries just to gain, uh, just to get more uh, foreign exchange. Uh, they think that the current crisis is mainly due to foreign exchange lack of foreign exchange, so they are just trying to, so they are not at, trying to address the root causes of the issues, as you pointed out. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, yeah, no, no, that, uh, that is, you know, uh, in this uh, crisis, one of the recommendations, the, the first recommendations that Basil Rajapaksa made to the cabinet in resolving this issue of the dearth of dollars in the country was to uh, send 75,000 of our people to Qatar, hoping that they will earn their dollars by washing their plates and then send the money back to the country. Now, this is the kind of shallow thinking of the Minister of Finance that we had. Right? And we, if you know, when the BOI uh, zone in Katunayaka in 1970, sorry, 1980, two years after it was promulgated, we had 50,000 people working. Today, we have 22,000 people working. Why? Because we, we have lost our human capital. All of them have gone abroad. So there is no, not much of an attraction for the people to come to our country and then set up their businesses. Because we don't have people to employ. Because they're not robotic. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, there are three, uh, three or four questions. So I will post that. And uh, we need to note that the time is running out. It is almost 11. Uh, ten, nine minutes past 11 here in Melbourne. Uh, uh, the questions are uh, one from Firdus, who is based in Melbourne. We have a legal profession that itself gave oath to protect the constitution. While the constitution of Sri Lanka undermines the rule of law explicitly that prevents to form an accountable government. But unfortunately, the same legal profession do not realize that the constitution is anti-rule of law and they look at the constitutional section in abstract. And uh, amendments to protect the constitution, how to empower legal profession to lead and to get back to the rule of law based new constitution. That is one question. Then there is a question from uh, uh, Dr. Prasanna Kure from Sri Lanka. Can I have uh, the question? One by one? Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, this is part of the, the empowerment and the making the constitutional provision stronger. I must say this, that the, it's not that there is something wrong with the constitutional provisions. It is because the constitutional provision that we have, that is article, particularly Article 12.1, where all persons are uh, equal before law, that we have been able to achieve even this much. Before the 1978 constitution, there were fundamental rights, but they were not enforceable. So this, uh, the, the constitutional provision that was brought in in 1978, that is famous, the constitution, the one that made it enforceable, the, the freedom of expression that is under part of Article 14.1, uh, A to uh, GF, we have the right, uh, freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom of engaging in the provision, all that is there in that. So the most of the provision, pro, uh, the problem that we are faced with in the, for the minority as well as the majority. The religious issues, whatever, the inequality before law is enforceable before the apex court of the country because of the provision that we have. So the legal profession is very much aware of this uh, 
uh, I'm sure you may uh, not have gone through most of the cases that have been fought. Most of these, don't forget one thing, that most of these cases that are fought on these public interest matters, the lawyers spend money for these cases. It is not that the lawyers are spent money. Lawyers have to spend money, but, but the, even for the one that I was just mentioning, because today the paper cost is so high. But they do that as a matter of public duty, because we owe due to the society. We, we, lawyers, sometimes the people say that think the lawyers, whenever they appear, that they have to be so. No, it's not so. There are many <clears throat> cases that they appear free of charge as a public duty. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dr. Prasanna Kurea from Sri Lanka. Even from the views expressed by most of the speakers here, it seems that many of us tend to believe that certain changes made to the governance system, example, strengthening the law, strengthening law, addressing corruption, will correct the situation. But it is hardly acknowledged the situation relates to the distorted power sharing by the government and the people. In other words, power of the people has been robbed by the government authorities. This robbed power from the people needs to be transferred, given back to people. I hope this concern may draw the attention of this forum. Uh, then, uh, can I go to the other question as well? Aaron was attending. The XIGP who has investigated the corruption has been persecuted. If the top people cannot be protected, who will investigate the corruption anymore? The central bank has the capacity for forensic money transfers and holding. Uh, Again, he's asking, can we resort to private prosecution? Willie uh, Senanayaka from Canberra, can we trust the main opposition party, SJB or even JVP and PP? Would they take any action to bring the stolen money back to the country? So there are, I think we will end up that then, by responding to those questions, we will end up the Q&A session. Uh, uh, relating to you, and then we will move on to general discussion. I think we will devote about 15 minutes for the general discussion and try to end the webinar. Okay. Uh, well, I think you want me to uh, tackle some of Yeah, questions? please. Yes. The one that deserves uh, me to respond would be Ken. That's a question that's been asked by many other people uh, locally and uh, internationally. That is, can we bring these money back into the country? The question is, do we know where these monies are? Answer is yes. Some of them know where these monies are. Unfortunately, they have been, they have been swept under the carpet. There are people who have, who have known these things. Some of the people who have known these things, I don't want to mention the names, uh, have been given uh, uh, top uh, VIP status and even sometimes not even proceeding in some of the prosecution that were deserved to be that they deserve to be prosecuted because they knew that they knew the, the where the monies were because they didn't take the steps that uh, were there uh, to uh, to bring these monies back but even now if there is a will it can be done only by authoritative uh, uh, party that's the government if the government has a will to do that they can bring that back they can first find out where they are now for instance it was always said that uh, the 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 monies of the royal family at that time, the Sri Lankan royal family, were all parked in Dubai. Now, not only, it's known, not only in Dubai, there are some other countries, including Uganda. But when you, uh, Dubai matter was uh, explored at that time, it was found the Dubai authorities, the banks, they told the Sri Lankan uh, the officers who went there to uh, make an effort to bring them back. They said, look, have you all prosecuted these people in your country? The question, answer was no. We have not prosecuted. When we have not prosecuted in the, those responsible in our country, how can we ask the, the foreign government or the foreign bank to uh, expect the, or rather make the money brought back to the country? That could not be done. So we were not sincere in our efforts. So mm. We have to get a, the party who has the will and the power and the Sincerity, bless you, the sincerity to bring back these monies. It is only that way that we can do that. Because people, there are some people, take even the, uh, the, 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 the Easter bomb. Shani Abhishekar in his uh, affidavit that he filed in the FR application has said very clearly there were three people 
front the police and the two uh, one or two in the the military that were to be arrested in connection with that because they were the kingpins they were the links they were obstructed so the people in power people in authority they know it it is only you and i who do not know about it we only come to the uh, question we know that there is an answer but we don't know that answer but there are people who know the answer but they don't give the answer nor take an effort to find the answer and then take the steps that ought to be taken that is where the problem is that is where the civil society intervention is required to pressurize these people on those focus that kind of a focus to do what they have to do thank you thank you mr jasuri uh, <clears throat> i think uh, let us move on to the uh, general discussion i'll i will uh, uh keep 15 minutes for that so if there are any general points could relate to uh anything that were discussed here by any of the speakers you could uh, uh write it down on the chat line or q and a or if you want to speak you raise your hand i will allow you to talk but it should be very brief maximum 3 minutes and uh, yeah are there any questions that needs to be can we take civil case for corruption through civil society that is one of the questions any questions or comments well if you are talking about civil case of corruption i think that is one of those cases uh, that i was made uh, making references to with regard to the case that will be filed by the three uh, university professors uh, professor uh, uh, bahim mendes and dr davis and dr atul sir some are called in the central bank matter uh, well that's a civilian kind of public interest litigation uh, members of the civil society that have filed that action yes well it has been that and it can be that thank you <coughs> excuse me <coughs> any other questions or comments it doesn't look like i think people will be tired we have been <laughs> spending close to 2 and a half hours now on this webinar all right um, i think uh, it will be time to conclude this session so i will uh, take this opportunity to thank all the panelists who have made uh, uh, very good contributions uh, to the discourse uh, professor uyangode and uh, dr jayapati vikramaratna mr soraya, soraya america dean and mr kulja surya uh, i think uh, they discussed many issues that we need to think about and uh, the main points that uh, we have to take away from this webinar is that the civil society need to be awakened or they need to uh, be made aware of the current situation and uh, uh, need to empower them and be mobilized so uh, yeah and uh, yeah uh, yeah that's a good idea uh, miss uh, saradina says whether we could do one minute closing comment yeah that's a good idea so i will start with uh, professor uyangode if he's available it's a one minute comment closing comment no uh, dr ikramath any last minute Oh, no, just to, yeah. I mean, I, that is a good conclusion that you have made. I'm at far as the legal community is also concerned. I think Upul will also agree with me that we, I think the lawyers have been dying, dying, doing a very good job, the practitioners. But we need more input from the legal academics also, uh, in, especially in relation to the issue that I raised. I think we need to uh, take this discourse and as uh, this anonymous uh, uh, attendee suggested, uh, he raised a very good issue. Uh, that the, 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 that this must these issues must be taken to the people and for them and to do that maybe yes that's a very good point you made that we have to use very uh, 
I mean, language that ordinary people can understand. I know some of us have been writing on these issues, Uyang and myself, who could have, do, have been doing a great job in court, but we need to get more and more professionals, uh, academics, political scientists, and sociologists, etc., to work uh, more, more uh, work uh, on these issues more, much more. Much more has to be done. Very, very little has been done, and much more has to be done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, Miss Dean. Thank you to everyone. You know, these issues cannot be solved like we go on a diet and we expect to lose weight in one week or one, one month. It has taken years for us to get here and it will take us years for us to leave this part. When Swami Vivekananda came to the United States to speak at the Parliament of the World Religions, he was asked, why is there no peace? And he said, give me 100 committed people. I will show you what world peace could look like. So in, in Sri Lanka today, what we need is committed people, not just people who talk. Advocacy is good, but grassroots activism is critical. And as we move forward, we must all have this conviction of the extraordinary possibility in our ordinary people. We have to have that conviction. And secondly, Upul said so much and it broke my heart to hear all the things that are that he document he spoke of. We need to create a public narrative, Upul, of all those. We need visuals. We need to remind people. This is very critical in organizing people and, and creating a culture of change. We need public narrative, a narrative. Because today the narrative is something else that the Aragalia happened. They were violent. They have come to destroy the country. We have to change that. And, to, and um, above all, I can't stress the importance of us building third places. Democracy demands educated and informed people. And I, though I live in the United States, my heart has always been in Sri Lanka. I come to Sri Lanka two, three times a year and I am willing to commit my time. I'll be in Sri Lanka. I'd love to go to the villages. I like to meet the people. I like to empower women they have to know that they have the power to change this system. So having said that, um, I, I hope we will all convene again, keep the conversation going and create those third places. The next time you go to a restaurant and you go there the second or the third time, build a community, talk and see what can be done because we need people to, th th these issues are very large. One or two of us can't, come on shows and write an article. We need the people. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Professor Vyangoda, are you there to make a closing comment? No. Uh, Mr. Jai Surya. Yes. Uh, thank you, Lionel. Thank you for the invitation and the useful uh, discourse that we have had for so long. I think I have, uh, well, all what I have to say finally, the conclusion would be we it's, it's very important to discuss, but it's even more important to take action. Let's get together and then find the out-of-the-box method, how we can make the government of Sri Lanka, those who are in, uh, in the rule, be made aware that the people are watching them and that they will be punished in the right way in, within the legal framework at the next election. Let, let us have a day that we all send them either emails or letters addressed to them. Let us have a day where we send hundreds of thousands of letters addressed to the president or to the prime minister or to a minister on certain given topics. Why can't we do that? It's done in some, in some other countries. Sometimes it has been done. Whenever the call was there for that. We need action. Let us think not necessarily that, something else. There may be a lot of minds put together. I think we can come up with different, different uh, course of action that we can adopt. Let's do something. Make the society aware that if they don't play the role that they are expected to play at this moment of time, at this hour of need, they will be forgotten. And the entire society and the country will also be forgotten and wiped out. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yasuri. So again, uh, I thank you all for your contributions and participation. 
and we will keep the conversation going and uh, also i would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, mr ranjit tir singh and mr anthony gration for uh, their assistance and uh, the interpreters uh, uh, ms sena ratna and mr mansu and also finally uh, to the uh, to the participants who have uh, joined us through various means live as well as through social media platforms and uh, without your participation this won't be success and for the all the questions and comments that were made uh, which made our webinar more lively so thanks again and uh, i wish you all uh, good night or good morning <laughs> depending on where you are thanks again all right good night good morning thank you bye bye bye, -bye.